you stand with me? Uh, we've been running through the Psalms. If you open up your Bibles to Psalms chapter 1, we're going to be at the first Psalms chapter 1. We're going to cover all six of those verses. And the title of this message is entitled, The Measure of a Man. The Measure of a Man. Let's read it together. Psalms 1. Let's begin. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doeth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in his season. And his leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drive away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall not perish. Father, give us ears to hear, heart to receive, and a mind to react. I thank you that no matter how many times we open the scriptures, if we're willing, you'll show us something. You'll show us something. So give us ears to hear, heart to receive, and a mind to react. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I tell you, this is definitely one of those passages. I have read this. I have read this. I've preached from this before. And Keith, I'm telling you, I see something today I didn't see before. If you are willing and you give God your, your undivided attention, he'll speak to you through the scriptures. And the things you thought you knew, he'll show you even more than what you knew. As I begin to study this and I begin to realize this is where we're going to end up this, this, uh, this preaching time, I, I, I begin to just kind of hone in on it and read it and just think on it and read it. And then I got some information and read it. I have in my possession a three-volume set. I'm so proud of this. This is called The Treasury of David. I have a library of books, but this Treasury of David was written by Charles Hagen Spurgeon. C.H. Spurgeon, he was that pastor of that 6,000 member church there in London in the 1800s and very prominent evangelist. Well, Spurgeon notes have been distributed and studied. This is his expositions on the Psalms. His expositions on the Psalms uh, uh, this is what he said. I just want to give you a little bit of the general exposition on Psalms 1. It says this. Blessed, see how the book of Psalms open up with a benediction, even as did the famous sermon of our Lord upon the mount. The word translated blessed is a very expressive one. The original word is plural, and it is converted, uh, controverted matter, whether it is an adjective or a subtanative. Hence we may learn the multiplicity of the blessings which shall rest upon the man whom God has justified and the perfection and greatness of the blessedness he shall enjoy. We might read it, O oh blessedness, and we may well read it as a joyful acclamation of the gracious man's felicity. May the light benediction rest on us. What is that? The condition of being blessed. If you look at the first verse there, and he gives us the, the, the positive before he gives us the negative. The first three verses really gives us the positive, and the last three verses give us the negative. He tells us, blessed is the man. Blessed, that's the state of being, is someone. The word man is not used in the sense 
not a man in the sense of a male species. The word man there is used in the plural sense of the word in Hebrew, ish, which means the species of mankind, ish and ish ah. So you are included, ladies, in that man, as he's talking about it. It's no disgrace or belittlement to you. I'm not calling you a man. I'm identifying you as a species of mankind. Amen? Amen. So the word man there is used, but it's inclusive to everyone. Blessed is the man. This opportunity is open to any man, woman, boy, or girl. If you position yourself a certain way and you continue to walk in that way, you're going to be in this state of blessedness. Blessed is the man that walks a certain way. Now, we have in our day many yardsticks that measure the success of people. We measure them by how much money they got, what house they live. We call people successful. We call people prosperous by the way they dress. But when you look at it spiritually, the measure of a man is not so much by what you see and what they possess, but the fruit they have. For the Bible said you'll know them by the fruit they bear. Spiritual fruit has to be known in order for you to know what you're looking at. You know, you don't raise up an apple to me and I tell you it's an orange because I know my fruit. I will tell you it's an apple. I will tell you it's an orange. Often we look at things and we determine people's state and measure their state because of how much stuff they got. And I, I, I've learned you can accumulate a lot of stuff. Some of us now got more stuff and don't realize where all that stuff comes from. You don't believe me, go to move. Like when we did. Like, Twanza, where did all this stuff come from? We gave away stuff and still had stuff. Stuff don't make you blessed. We measure people by that. But in the spiritual realm, it's more tangible. The visible evidence is what we see in the life. General success. For the believer is more internal than external. Because when the world tries to tell you you're blessed when you got a house, for those who are still living in an apartment, what that make you? For those who say you're blessed because you got a plane and you got cars and all of that, for those of us who have never owned a plane, some might not even ride on one. What do that make us? So we have to re reimagine, re condition our theology and let the scripture speak. The psalmist here is telling us the state of mind, the state of being this person will be in. And that's why it's difficult for God's children who live in a materialistic world like we live in to gauge their success in their walk with God. Psalms 1 is like a doorkeeper. It's like the doorkeeper for the believer success. And as the plumb line of God's word move alongside your life and see how you measure up. What is the true measure by which you, as a professed believer, profess your belief? Now, I'm a man that know how to read a, a, a ruler. And the measure... When I would tell someone I need a pipe, cut it 32 and 3 eighths. It must be exact for the measurement to be right. And there's been many a times I go behind people and check only to find out they did not know how to truly read their measuring stick. And because they did not, the measure of what they were called to measure out was not right. The true measurement for what makes a Christian can never be material things. Because yeah. Sister Bessie never had a car, but she had little Jesus while she rode the subway mm -hmm. in the inner city. And she lived in subsidized housing, but she was the spiritual voice in the, in the subsidized housing. So we can't determine her blessed state by what she has, but by the spirit of God that is allowed to work in and through her characteristics of a successful believer. He's separated in one major factor. Somebody say, how you walk? 
Yeah, the walk tells it all. How you walk, how you walking, how you walk. The sexual believer is separated in his walk. Uh, the word walk there is, is, is really uh, uh, interpreted as a lifestyle. And there's three things the walk doesn't do. He doesn't believe like the wicked. He doesn't listen to their counsel. He doesn't behave like the wicked. He doesn't belong with the wicked. Kurt Franklin is trying to do all of these things. He's believing with the wicked. He's behaving like the wicked. And now trying to get along with the wicked. He done took off his, his shirt and his tie. He's putting skinny jeans on and a half t-shirt. Dancing like he's the new Michael Jackson since Michael Jackson died. And he's doing songs with rappers. I used to love Kirk Franklin, but now I pray for him. He's not in a state of blessedness. He's made a choice, just like many of those artists are. And this is why you have situations that is happening because we get our eyes fixed on success. The Bible said, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. What benefit, what union had light and darkness? Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. Three steps. You don't behave like the wicked. You don't, you don't believe like the wicked. You, you don't belong with the wicked. Why do you need rappers on stage to give your message? If they're not repenting, they don't need to be up on your stage. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, come out from among them. Be ye separate. These are familiar passages. Touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. And I'll be a father unto you. This is the kind of walk the psalmist was talking about. And then you will be, look at the tender word there, sons and daughters. The downward progress comes in three things. If you're writing, you can write this down. Walk, stand, and sit. This is what the psalmist is saying. The person walk, he takes a stand, and he sit. Now let me ask you, before we, I put Kirk Franklin's name out there, and this is going on record. Where are you walking? Who you took your stand with, and where you see it at. Because all those things are going to determine whether you're blessed or not. Watch it. Walk, stand, and sit. We are in a very dangerous era now where everybody wants to walk and get along with everybody. We take our seat. We take our stand. This is what Lot did. Remember Lot? Mm -hmm. He took a walk away from godliness. He took a stand along with the witness, the wicked, and he was sitting right there among them to the point he got to the gate. When he got to the gate, he was able to give influence. And we know he was a righteous man because way over there in Peter, the Bible said, that's the spirit to watch what they were doing. When do you get vexed enough that you go away from it? When do you get vexed enough that you turn it off? When do you get vexed enough that you no longer want to be around it? The successful believer realizes there's a vast difference between the world he was saved out of and he lives accordingly. Those of you who know you've been saved and brought out of the world, you know there's a difference. You realize that difference and you live in light of it. So, so, so he says, this is a state for that person. The successful believer is genuinely and completely in love with the word of God. Absolutely. I might hurt your feelings here, but you'll get over it. Do you really love him enough? That his word has become food. The believer, his delight is in the word. That's what the, the psalmist says. His delight is in the law. He said his delight is in the law of the Lord. His joy is in the law of the Lord. It's that kind of delight that makes you open this book and read it. 
It's that kind of delight that makes you have insight in it. It makes you question. It makes you ask things. It makes you ponder things. When the word becomes your delight, it's more than just Bible study. To the child of God is the very word of truth. It is God breathed, infallible, and inerrant, absolutely perfect. Man, I got people I get around, they talk about, oh, the Bible was written by men. They put, they do everything they can to put the Bible down. And I don't care how much they put it down, I put it up. Amen. Hello. I don't care how much they don't like it, I got one. Just about everywhere I turn, there's a Bible at my house. I got a, I got, got some, some antique Bibles I like to look at. I got some ancient Bibles. It's back in the 1800s. Very rare old books. I love the Word of God. They're in a memoir case. They're very valuable and old, and I love them. I look at them. I, I'm so glad I have them. I love to have a 1611 copy. I don't have that kind of money. I love to have a scroll you can open up. I like the Word of God. Not just to have it. I love to read it. I love to talk to people who talk about the Bible. Me and my father-in-law and my father, we would have discussions about the Bible. And as a young preacher, most of my talk was around these older men who had their lesson. They knew their lesson. And they didn't have no power Bible. They had just to read the Bible. And boy, Ella Roberts could quote scripture and man, he'd call out. I remember one night we was in Bible study, he called out like seven scriptures. And they remembered every one he called out and called for them as he got to them. Like, boy, I was amazed at that. But this is what these people embraced because they were taught to feast on the word of God. And they did it. Job said in Job 23 and 11, he said, my foot have held his steps. His way have I kept. This is where he's sitting, standing, and walking. He said, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. Job 23, 11, and 12. He said, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than necessary food. And trust you me, we love our necessary food. Job said, I love your word more than that. Friends, when God has said what he said and you love it more than your very natural food that you eat to live on and sustain on, it is then now he has become the apple of your eye. In Matthew 4 and 4, Jesus made that famous statement, man can't live by bread alone. But what? Every word. Not just the parts you like. Because there's some good stuff in here we like to make us shout all night, won't it? And there's some other parts that make you just sit there and go, ooh, really? Let's admit it. When they give us those good parts, we love ice cream, don't we? But when them beats come, them, them different tasting things, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth, milk is for babies. Peter said in 1 Peter 2, as newborn babes, we desire the milk, the sincere milk. Sincere, that pure, unfiltered word. That word that will benefit and help you to grow. He said here, yeah, that which you grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. But after you drink milk a while, guess what? Somebody say it with me, I need some meat. I need some meat. I need some meat. Meat is good. Meat brings strength to the body. Nothing does more for your body, protein-wise, than meat. The writer of Hebrew said everyone that uses milk is unskillful. And here's our problem, because the people don't realize how to walk, how to sit, or how to stand, because they're still on this milk. And while they're at this naive state, been in the church 30 years, but yet don't know when he's supposed to be mixing and mingling with the world. That's somebody on milk, y'all. Strong meat come to those who realize, I don't care how good he look, I don't care how good it tastes, it's not for me if I am a child of God. I don't care if he tall, dark, and handsome. I don't care if she 34, 36, 22, 30, what was that saying? <laughs> Whatever it is, if it ain't for you, you know it, and you stand with it. Am I the only one in here? Say something. Amen. Milk causes people never to mature. And we have in our church world, people have been preaching and they 
still milk preachers. Come on, man, you're supposed to be a meat man by now. Put some meat on the table for the people. They need to hear more than Jesus, but we know that. Tells me what to do when I'm reaping. Show me in the word of God how I must live. Blessed is the man that walks. Help me to know what kind of walk aligns my life right with God. We got too many milk watered down preachers who refuse to say anything about anything that imposes on people's lifestyle because holiness challenges the sin in our life. Holiness challenges our comfort zone. And when you go to preach a, a sound word, they look at you like you're crazy. Because you didn't uh, and make them run around. God forbid you try to stand and teach like I'm trying to do. Strong meat belong to them who are full age. That's to come to a level of growth. Jesus said, look, this bread is for everyone. In John 6, 51, he said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. He tagged eternity with this. When we were going through John, when we got to this passage, and we saw the devastation this state took on the religious people because they just could not realize, they just could not fathom the idea of what he said because they were not spiritual enough to understand metaphorically what he meant. You got to feast on him. Beloveds, we are called a feast on him. Have you been feasting? Have you been feasting? It's going to tell. We're going to know by where you walk and how you stand and how you sit. The condition is going to be blessed if you do right. It don't come up short. If you do what you're supposed to do, God's going to honor what he said. Blessed is going to be. And you will be like Job. You will be the one that says, though he slay me yet, will I trust him? Somebody say amen. Though I'm going through the valley in the shadow of a death, I fear no evil. Why? I know he with me. You got to know that deep down within. Because when life brings you to those perpetual places where you question whether or not God is with you, it's then that you got to be able to reach way, 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 way down and be able to realize the Lord is my help and my strength, my present help, even in the time of trouble. Clap your hands and give him praise if you believe it. He is that one I can depend on. He is that one that will make a way out of nowhere. Ah, he'll do it. Somebody say, yes, he will. Yes, he will. David said in Psalms 19 and 10, more to be desired than gold. Some of y'all, well, I can say y'all. Some people. Can I put it that way? That way nobody get offended. But if it fit, you got to wear that shoe. Some people will give up the word of God in a heartbeat for their own personal comfort. We don't want to suffer. We don't want no inconvenience. We'll put it down. We want our own comfort. We want the things that make us feel good and happy. And if God dare allow anything that challenges our comfort, we get upset. Why? It ain't your job to ask why. It's your job to praise him. At all times. And let his praise be in your mouth. And while your heart is ripped open and you're crying tears, wondering why you still are willing to lift your hands and say, I will bless thee, O Lord, with my hands lifted up. I will bless thee, O Lord. It's not easy to do it, but I'll do it because your word says do it. There's nothing in me that want to do it, but because I know your word and I have a relationship with you and I know that the weeping that endures for a night, there is a joy coming in the morning. I'm going to praise you now and in the darkness of this night. I'm going to run on and see what the end is going to be because even though I'm going through it, I know you are with me. His word is food. I'm going to run through these. His word is also light. In Psalms 119, 105, the Bible says his word is a lamp and a light. One is immediate and the other one is far going. One is for right now, and the other one is so you can see how to get where you're going. Ain't that wonderful? He don't just give us light as a vision. 
He gives us light for we to step right now. In John 17 and 17, he says that word is truth. As he was praying, Jesus said, sanctify them through your word. That word is truth. It's a mirror in James 1, 23 and 25. It is the mirror by which the light of the soul is reflected. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 and 27, it's water. The Bible says you are cleansed by the washing of the water, by the word. It cleanses, it quenches. John 4, 13 and 14, Jesus said, I'll give you a drink that refreshes. In Psalms 1, 19 and verse 50, it, 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 it'll refresh the soul. In 1 Peter 1, 23, it's the seed that's planted in our heart. That word is a seed that plants in our heart. I've never seen a seed that took planting and took root and didn't grow. The writer of Hebrews said it's like a sword sharper than any two-edged sword. In their day, the two-edged sword was the weapon of choice. He said that word is it. Why? Hear me, folks. There is not a sinful habit the word of God can separate from you. If you want victory, get in the word. Memorize scripture. Let scripture ring in your heart and watch freedom come. I don't care what it is. You real want real freedom? Get in the word. The more words you get, the more freer you'll find yourself from it. You got an addiction? Get in the word. Memorize scripture. Study scripture. There are people in here who know what I'm saying. When real life catastrophe attack your body, get in the word. Put a word on it. If it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for you. You look at that account. Jesus didn't give him all a lot of play. What he said, it is written. You can't tell him what's written if you don't know what's written. Hello. You got to know what's written. And when you know what's written, you can give it to the devil. You can give it to your mama. You can give it to your daddy. You can give it to everybody. Why? Because you got it in your heart. It comes a bonus then. Jeremiah said, is not that word like a hammer? In Jeremiah 23, 29, it crushes. It'll beat it down. Proverbs 16, 24 says it can build up. In Revelation 2, 16, it can tear down. I love this. In Luke chapter 24, after Jesus has been resurrected, the disciples don't know it's Jesus. And he's walking on the road to Emmaus. And the two disciples don't know Jesus is talking with them. And he opens up a scenario where he can preach. And beginning from Moses all the way up, he gave them the word of God. And it all of a sudden vanishes. And he left this impression on them. He said, didn't our heart burn? I like that kind of word, y'all, that burns my heart. I like it when I come and I hear that kind of word that gets in my spirit and helps me to be a better me. That's the kind of word I need. That's the kind of word I want. Jeremiah said, I tried to sit on it, but it was like fire. Shut up in my bones. And folks, nothing better fires us up when we know gospel truth and we get around those who don't embrace it. There is something that rises up in us. Why? That word is like a fire. It's burning to be known. It's burning to be repeated. It's burning to tell those to stop their sinful acts. It burns within us, don't it? There's a holy woe that burns. Why? That word is like a fire ready to consume sin. And as much as we love our sons and daughters, we have no problem telling them they're wrong. They can stop calling us for a day or two. It's all right, man. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? We got no problem telling them they're wrong. You know you are not be doing. We tell them, don't we? Call it what you want. It's sinful. It's wrong. And after a while, we have to warn them, if you don't stop, do you love it as you should? Has it captured your full attention? Not only does the successful believer love the book, but he lives out the book daily. It's internalized. 
It becomes a standard of faith. You know, the Bible, I tell you, is our basic instructions before leaving earth. Basic instructions. Basic. Before leaving earth. Even though every move, every decision is made against the, the word of God, they want to take it out of our hearts, out of our churches, out of our schools, out of our minds. They can't get it out of our hearts. It's already been released in the earth, so it's already at work doing its awesome work, touching hearts, changing lives. And that's why Jesus left us with that statement. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Watch this, y'all. The, the, the Bible gives us the instruction. It shows us that imperative, who we are in light of the finished work of Christ. And then it also show us what we must do because of who we are. The measure of a man could never be the clothes they wear or the house or the car. It could never be that. If you're waiting on that, then you're going to miss God because he might show up in country overalls. He might show up in a manner you're not looking for. And because he wasn't looking like he thought he ought to look, you didn't even realize that was your blessing. Because the preacher didn't show up with a robe on and an entourage. When did we ever need an entourage? He didn't have an armor bearer. We didn't bow before him. We like those kind of people. They not made themselves God. And now we got dignitaries now instead of having men of God. Popularity contests. What a mess we made of it. No wonder the writer of the song says, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. Does the Bible fill your thoughts? Do you find yourself being uncontrollably drawn to it? If not, you're in trouble. Do you find yourself wanting to just get a verse here and there? I call them nuggets. You ever find yourself just wanting to get a quick little nugget? Get a quickie. Yeah. Sometimes at work, when I'm sitting at a desk, I, I got Bible, I got my phone, I got computer. I have to get a quick one in. A little quick, quick Bible study, quick lesson. And then, you know, preachers have to eat too. So I enjoy sometimes sitting down and listening to somebody else preach. Do you find yourself consumed with its content, mesmerized in the meditation of it? Let me tell you something. The Bible can never be better than when it's read and then lived out. I'm going to say that again. The Bible will never be better than when you read it and start living it out. The prosperity is this. Watch this. The promise is this in verse 3. He'll be like a tree. We're almost there. He'll be like a tree planted. Now, I didn't see this, Sister Q. I don't read this forever. But he said a tree planted, and he used the word plural, the rivers of water. Man, I lit up. That jumped out at me. He'll be like the tree planted. Now, we know the Psalms is poetic in nature. So in a poetic fashion, the Lord has given us a, 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 a look at what the believer's life is going to look like when he properly positions himself. And you have the ability to place yourself there. When you walk, when you stand, and when you sit, he says, the end game is you're going to end up planting. That's good. Some people are not planting. This is why they, they, they don't know what to stand for. That's the milk babies. They're not planted. When you get planted, the Lord said, not only will you get planted, when you get planted, a storm can't blow you away. He said, they'll get planted, but not only get planted, but look at that, by the rivers. Cool. You mean to tell me if one dry up, I got the other one there to nourish me? 
I never thought of this. I'm looking at this, my sisters and brothers, and I'm realizing that if I'm planted in God like I should, I'm going to be positioned by the rivers. Lord, what are these many rivers? If you said just river, I'd have let it go. Just look at somebody talking about he can't let it go like that. Because he said rivers. And I don't care what, what version you look at, nobody changed that word. You look at all the other versions, it said rivers. Plural. Now, I did get kicked out of school, but I didn't go back. But I do remember when you have an S there, that means more than one. This blessed me, and I hope it bless you. Not only does the Lord plan us by the rivers, Lord knows we need the supply of the river to come and help us. Because as we go through this land, it's, it's almost like sometimes we get into charted areas that are dry and, and think when things dry up, the Lord said, I know your peace dried up, but I got a river of mercy. Hallelujah. That's going to sustain you. And I know when your unforgiveness dry up, I got a river of grace to make you remember that I spared you when you could have been put away for your sin. And because you don't want to forgive someone and your river of forgiveness dries up, God said, I want you to realize I got rivers of mercy that's rolling right by you. And you're experiencing the rivers of my mercy that is flowing. I know at times when we get sick in our body, the Lord said, I got rivers of peace that gives you peace while you're laying up in the hospital bed letting you know it's going to be alright. He said I'll plant you by the rivers and when one get out there'll be another one to kick in. There'll be a constant supply. You'll always be sustained. Then it begin to make sense to me. The reason why Job could bless the Lord is because he was planted by the rivers and because he was planted by the rivers when one storm came he had to supply God that was still Restoring his soul. God will give us some rivers so that we can have some anchorage. We can have something to hold us. We can have something that will sustain us. Aren't you glad today that you'll get planted and not just get planted, but you'll get planted by rivers. Rivers over the overflow. Rivers of blessings. Rivers of grace. Rivers of peace. Always close to the life. Always the tree planted by the river is never dry. It never will. Look at the benefit he said it has. The leaf, which is the most extended part of the tree, shall not wither, shall not go away. He said, I don't care what it look like. I don't care how much wind is blowing. It's going to stay right there. Somebody shout, I'm planted. Uh, yeah. Somebody shout, I'm planted. I'm planted by the rivers. I'm planted. I'm planted by the rivers. And because I'm planted, I'm going to have an endless supply. The believer who lives close to God will never be dry. He'll never be cold. Never be indifferent. He will be vibrant, lively, productive. Many never know the joy of drawing off of Christ daily. As a result, they are spiritually wielded and dead. Looking, the droughts of life and dry seasons never seem to affect the believer who is planted near the river. Why? He is connected to an unfailing source. The life of a successful believer stands head above all around him. That's why Acts chapter 4, when they saw the boldness of Peter, they perceived these unlearned men had been with Jesus to be planted Gives you an ability. Unlike some plants which live for a season. Your tree shall not die out. The value of private prayer and Bible study. A tree cannot transplant itself. It's a work of God's grace. And he always plants us. In good soil. Near the water supply. And it's productive. It's productive. He brings forth fruit. He brings fruit in the season. It's predictable. 
There's going to be a season and you're going to be beneficial. There's going to be a season. Y'all, the productivity of your life is going to bring you to a fruitful season. You're going to reap what you sow. Oh, yeah, you're going to get some fruit. It might not be godly fruit, but it's going to be the fruit that you planted. So I want to employ you to be productive for the kingdom because you're going to have a harvest. And the predictability of it is there is a season. You know, uh, 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 when the guy sing that song, this is my season for greatness, to reap what I have sown, partially there, there's some truth to that, but we never get to determine when it is. God know when the season is. It's the only thing with that song that I got a problem with. You can't say this is your season. When God brings you to the season, you know it. And, and trust me, by the time you get to that season, you be done suffering so. You don't go around bragging, this is my season. You're so grateful you're there. You just embrace that moment. And while nobody else know that tear coming down your eye, you know what it took to get you there to that season. You know the hurt. You know the pain. Nobody knows the sorrow you've been through like the Lord. But you know this means fit this season this is a season of greatness. This is a season of miracle. This is a season to reap what I have sown. He says your leaf is not going to wither. The successful believer is constant. That's why the writer said, be steadfast, be unmovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know your labor, yes, there's work involved. Your labor. Stop waiting on somebody else to do all the work. Your labor. Be willing to do your part. Do you possess the characteristics of a successful believer? What is the measure by which you, in your walk with God, take your stand? If so, we got the positives before the negative. Because the negative is just an outright condemning to the unbeliever. He said the ungodly are not so. It's not that way for them. They can't stand in the judgment. But oh, pastor, I thought everybody stands in the judgment. Yeah, they're going to go before the judgment, but they won't be able to stand in the sense of hearing him say, well done. They're going to take their stand and tremble and fall at the sinful state by which they found themselves in in the day of judgment. I hope you have seen yourself among the happy ones who are encouraged. I hope you see yourself as the one who is blessed and you don't have a lot of money in the bank. You're content with your daily bread. However, if you saw yourself lacking, I want you to know Jesus stands ready, willing and able to make those, to make those who are willing to repent, give them another chance. May we bow our heads and pray. May we bow our heads. May we consider what is so made available to us, the blessed state of the believer. The blessed state of the believer. The blessed state we have. The psalm says, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arm. What a blessedness, what a peace of mind. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for the awesome power of your word that speaks to our heart and reminds us that whoever would choose to place themselves can be blessed. 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 I thank and I praise you, Lord. We give you the glory. 
we give you the honor. And I ask, Father, that you would look over everyone here. Let what has been said take root in their hearts. That they might desire to be that one that will walk, take their stand, and sit in a position that honors you. Not in the seat of the scornful. Their walk, let it be aligned with the walk that is God honoring. May our walk truly exemplify the God of the heavens and earth who brought us out of the darkness into this marvelous light. Thank you for turning on the light and giving us a greater expression of that light that we can grow and be productive sons and daughters. To anyone here that desire to repent, say, I'm sorry, I've fallen short. And I'm willing to make a mark from here to make sure my walk where I stand and where I sit is in total alignment no matter who interferes with God and His Word. If that's you and you're willing to do so, the mercy of God is extended to us all. May we take to heart that we have a place we can position ourselves and God will honor us and we too can be blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.